So we're gonna be checking out this video from Force Gaming. He's been doing like freaking outstanding coverage on Diablo 4. And in this thumbnail, I'm not sure if you guys can see, but like in this thumbnail, we have a very... If I do this, will it show up the... Yeah, it will. We have a very disappointed Force here. Like, look at him just going... Oh. <laughs> he's like... He's not particularly happy about this, so... I am curious to see what is going on. I think I know what this one is, the skill assignment with all of the gold to it, because I actually saw a, a video from uh, from an interview with IGN that Blizzard did. And in that video, apparently, I, I thought it was funny because I actually wanted to bring it up in this video, and I just noticed that the thumbnail specifically talks about that. But they say something like, we want uh respecking to be a meaningful thing we want you to associate yourself with a character that you've made and therefore the more skills you want to change on your character the more expensive it's going to be their justification for that is like well we want players to feel like oh this is like my whirlwind barbarian or something like that and if you want to have another barbarian this based around like shock waves or leaps or something they want you to go ahead and make a new one and in reality, they're saying, oh, we want this because we want players to be invested in their characters, to have like these meaningful things. But all I hear when they say these things is like, we want players to be engaged, playing new characters all the time. <laughs> dude, the fuck out of here, dude. Anyway, before we even start uh, with the video, I'm going to be linking it. And I want you guys to go ahead and... Uh, Put this playing in the background, you can mute the pain. Um, the, the, like, you know, you can have, like, there's a little thing up here that you can mute it so that you can listen to me. But you put this playing in the background so that you give him some watch time. Because I really like Force's content and I don't want reactions to it to negatively impact uh, his stuff. We're also going to be liking it, obviously, right from the get-go. And, uh, yeah, let's see, let's see what Force has to tell us. Pretty much. It looks like the Diablo 4 news just doesn't stop. This week has been pretty much jam-packed with new updates. A lot of this coming from IGN, who continues to pump out content from that one interview they did a few weeks ago. Hey, you know what? I respect the hustle, and how else are you gonna it is what it is. videos a day after all? So yeah, we got a couple of videos since our last update. We know that we have an audience of folks that have played lots of Diablo and are looking for a challenge. And so our, our second world tier, world tier two, and our first world tier are available from level one when you first start playing the game. So this is just basically the two starter difficulty tiers, normal and hard. They're just calling them world tiers and having them available straight from the get go. So the, the first tier adventure mode tuned more for people who are new to Diablo or people who just want to um, enjoy the story and not worry about the combat too much that of my big my biggest thing about this whenever it comes to because like you might even remember like if you've played diablo 3 how you would like oh i'm gonna start the game on a harder difficulty and whatnot the biggest thing is that it all depends on what you can get for playing the game at a harder difficulty so like for instance the main thing that you would get from playing Diablo 3, back when I was playing at least, I don't know what it's like nowadays because I haven't played Diablo 3 in a good long while, but like the main thing that you would get from playing at a higher difficulty would be like, uh, oh, you get a little bit more experience because I mean, let's face it, sure, you have you get magic fine, but who the fuck cares about level 10 loot? Oh, I got this, you, this uh, legendary item at level 10. Well, good. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> it's it's worthless unless you can like upgrade these items uh to be meaningful at end game or something like that but i don't know if that is part of the plan or not but you need to have a good justification to have players go through a harder difficulty on an arpg at least in my opinion first is a great idea we shouldn't forget that a vast majority of people who are going to play this game like aren't the kind of people looking for the more difficult hard or hardcore experience like that's exactly. not there's certainly not anyone watching this video there's a lot of people well, what do you mean what People who just want a casual, easy baseline. They want to breeze through. They want to see what happens with uh, all their favorite Diablo characters. Where it's going on with Tyrael? Is Deckard Cain still kicking around? So yes, of What do you mean Deckard Cain? He better not be kicking around. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> 
course, cater to those people, give them an adventure mode, let them have fun and not die 10 times when they just wanna hear the next bit of the story. For people who are looking for more of a challenge, we have that second uh, mode. And I'm, I'm surprised he didn't mention it, but we actually know what that second mode is, tier two. It's called veteran mode. It is just a harder version and it's gonna give you, as you expect, better rewards, increased item drops, increased experience and gold, all at the cost of having to fight harder enemies. You might die sometimes, right? Occasionally, but it's not gonna be quite too hard. Tier two, or veteran is still going to be, you know, things ramp up in the later tiers. And then as you level up and you get up to level 50, you're going to progress through those additional world tiers. And those work somewhat more like the Diablo 3 world tiers uh, or uh, difficulties work in that as your gear is progressing, and of course, depending on how optimized your gear is in terms of efficiency, you're going to progress up through those world tiers and that's going to set effectively how your kill rate of monsters, the rate of loot acquisition. I love how he says what it affects is your kill rate of monsters, where basically what he's saying is uh, everyone has more health. So yeah, I was, I was about to say every monster becomes spongier. It just takes more hits to kill kill rate is slower and until of course your power progresses beyond that point and then the kill rate becomes faster and then you move on to the next tier and that's kind of the leapfrog that takes place and as you get up into those later world tiers too in diablo 4 you're going to get access to uh, sacred uh, and ancestral item tiers which are, are higher tiers of items that have um, more exciting stuff there's even a few items that are reserved for those Kilt of the Plaguebringer, 46 max life, 11% elite damage reduction, 3.5 reduced potion cooldown, one rank to hunt the weak. Your poisons no longer deal damage over time, it's that 127, 127% of the total damage is dealt to the target when your poisons expire. So it just becomes a ticking time bomb, pretty much. With a 27% increase in damage. Wow. This, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be real. This item does not feel particularly interesting, but, you know, I, I am not playing the game, so I don't know how meaningful that is, but it doesn't sound particularly interesting to me. Stormwalk, Stallmark, Stall, Stall, <laughs> I can't say this word. Stormwalker's Cudgel. Unique mace. Fast weapon, 2% overpowered chance. 13 all stats. That's nice. 6% melee damage. 8% critical strike damage, 5% attack speed. Hit effect. When Hurricane deals damage, there's a chance to automatically cast Tornado at the target for free. Okay, this one's cool. This one's really cool. I like this one. I don't like the Kilt of the Plaguebringer, but I like St Stormwalker's Cudgel. Mad Wolf's Glee. <clears throat> Chest piece. 22 strength. 51 max life. 4% dodge chance. 5% damage reduction. Poison enemies hit by your lacerate or thrash instantly deal 25% of the remaining damage to all nearby enemies. That's all right. <clears throat> I guess the idea is that you combine all of these for a lot of the stuff. I guess they still count it as poison, even if... No, because... Oh, these might be for something, something else, but uh, interesting. I like I like the the last two ones. I don't like Kilt of the Plaguebringer. And this is also basically how it's worked in Diablo 3 as you climb the torment levels, which is their difficulty, just D3's version of world tiers more or less. As you climb that, you're going to be more likely to get those higher tier rarity items as opposed to the lower torment levels. So it's going to work just like that in with world tiers in Diablo 4. So you climb the world tiers and the higher you go, the higher percent chance there's going to be for the sacred and ancestral items to drop. Having a way to measure your progression you know, through world tiers or in D3 was like through torment levels and immortal. It's like going from hell one to hell five. Oh, they had hell levels. Please don't talk about immortal ever again. Please. Can we just like forget that fucking piece of shit cancerous game exists? Please. For the love of all that is holy. Stop. Fuck. An immortal. I don't, I don't know. I, I made it like two hours before. <laughs> That's toxic force. You have to play the whole thing. Like I did. You have to, you have to subject yourself to the pain and misery of this fucking trash game. Oh my God, dude. Oh my fucking God. You know, you know that I, like sincerely, the gaming industry would be in a better place if this fucking game just get deleted. Deleted.
the gaming industry would be in a better place. Well, it's like going from hell one to hell five. Oh, they had hell levels in Immortal. I don't, I don't know. I, I made it like two hours before I checked out of that one. Although honestly, I probably should have played it more just for like academic reasons. Like, yes, you should, like I did. <laughs> you should have suffered like I did. You know, you know when the only diaries say, I've sacrificed everything. That's me. When it comes to Diablo Immortal, I sacrificed everything. I played that game for what, 40 hours? God, that, that was fucking hell. Those are 40 hours of my life I'm never going to get back. What a waste of fucking time. I, maybe I'll go play some more Immortal. Just, no, never. No, I won't actually. I changed my mind. <laughs> As you become Good. more powerful, you want to challenge yourself. And then by challenging yourself, you get better loot, which means you get more powerful. It means you want to challenge yourself. And so you kind of get into this. You want to be able to have that experience. And, and Diablo really shines when you find that sweet spot. Like oftentimes you'll get to a point where slightly underpowered, working your butt off. You get that amazing drop. Now you're kind of into it. And then you get another amazing. Now you're overpowered and everything's too easy. So now you need to ratchet up the difficulty so you get better. Now you're slightly underpowered again. You get into your sweet spot. And I do like I know that that is a big part of this the sort of progression kind of leapfrogging where you've got a baseline difficulty the damage you're taking how long it takes to kill enemies and then you build yourself up through either leveling up but once you're at max level through getting more gear that makes you stronger makes you take out enemies quicker and survive longer and then you move to the next tier and all of a sudden you shift to the bottom of that uh, totem pole and then you build yourself up and then it becomes easy and then you go to the next tier and that is the sort of like leapfrog progression that these games are really built around how they're structured but also i feel like if that is all that you're doing at some point you just kind of check out at least i for me personally i yep yep you 100 percent do you you 100 percent do it's but i mean that's that's kind of like the point of arpgs i feel like which is why I'd, i in all honesty i don't really play that many arpgs like every now and then i'll grab onto one and I'll play the crap out of it. But the main reason I played Diablo is because I love Diablo 2. That's the main reason why I played Diablo 3. It's the main reason why I like Diablo to begin with is because I just have fond memories of Diablo 2 and I like that world. So whenever people start telling me, oh, you, sh you should play this ARPG instead because it's better. It's like, I think you, you fundamentally miss the point because like one of the things that draws me into Diablo is the universe itself, the, the world of Sanctuary. I like it a lot. But yeah, unfortunately, they haven't been making like good games in that universe. And the story of Diablo 3. <laughs> what a fucking bad joke, dude. The story of Diablo 3 was ass beyond ass. Like ass beyond ass. That's what the story of Diablo 3 was as far as I'm concerned can't just deal with that leapfrog progression being the only thing and i do really feel that there either need to be some major milestones which really mix that up instead of constantly doing that yo-yo there need to be some bigger milestones especially content wise i really really think it's beneficial to have some big things that you're working that you're doing that leapfrogging towards i mean a great example is with mmos you're moving through these difficulty different types of content normal dungeons and then hard mode dungeons and then maybe there's some games will have a, a higher difficulty version of dungeons but then also mixing up those dungeons with different affixes and then going from dungeons into the higher difficulty thing being raids like that kind of thing and i really hope that they are delivering on that as well in d4 i really hope that's something that they aim for instead of just being like the the greater rift climb for example that that i feel like i do every season in d3 and it feels the same every season in D3. Yeah, I, let me just add too that um, on the later world tiers, we saw an opportunity to add a, a challenge that world tiers culminate in, <laughs> as it were. Um, so at the end of, you know, tiers three, four, and five, there's a, a boss that you can defeat in order to unlock the next world tier. So that is a great idea. That is a perfect example of something additional. And I actually really like the concept. I'm curious. I'm curious as to how these bosses are going to be connected to the concept of a battle pass because it just kind of like feels like those are things almost that align perfectly. It's like, hey, you level up in the world tier, you level up in the battle pass, you get a double dopamine hit that gets you fucking hooked, just like you, you drew a triple seven on a fucking slot machine. <laughs> it's like... I'm very curious as to how the synergy is going to work around that because you know they're doing something about that synergy like a, a thousand percent. But it does seem like a cool thing. If, if you were to remove the battle pass 
away from it. This whole thing about like, oh, you defeat this major boss and then you have access to a new difficulty level. That actually sounds really interesting, particularly if those major bosses are not procedurally generated. These are actually bosses that they've tuned to be a meaningful encounter at that difficulty level. I think that could be fucking amazing of not just jumping to the next world tier once you feel like you're able to do it, but actually having to pass this hurdle, like take a test that determines whether or not you're actually capable. Now, unfortunately, from what I've been seeing uh, from people in the beta talking about it, it seems like at least how it's currently implemented in the game in this current, current version, this current build, the world tier bosses aren't especially difficult. And even that that last one, the level 100 boss, isn't especially difficult. And so that, I, I feel like it should be, right? I feel like yeah, it, should it should be a real challenge. And Definitely. It, it, it can't just be like a damage sponge. And then once you have enough, I mean, it can be, but it would be better if it wasn't. Not to mention, it's like, how, the, how does this work? Can you have like a bunch of other players be there and just fucking hard carry you? Doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose? That's weird. That is really weird. <clears throat> I feel like it should be more than just a DPS check, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And if they aren't already in the game, ideally they can put mechanics in the game that make it more than just a DPS check and have some sort of skill, some attentiveness required involved. Because yeah, based on what people are saying currently, as long as you're like sort of paying attention, these bo these world tier bosses that you need to clear to progress are a cakewalk really. The, the last world tier uh, where we, you can gear all the way up to 100, has a boss at the end of it, which is extremely difficult. Something to stand up against with all of your optimized gear and say like, all right, this is what I've been building toward, you know? And this actually really has me wondering something else is, is this level 100 boss, the, what the, the sort of like last bit of thing that you're working towards, that you're progressing through all of the end game content, you're doing the Helltide zones, you're doing the Nightmare Dungeons, you're doing the open PVP farming gear that way. Are all of those things in service of working towards a level 100 boss? And is that like the pinnacle of it? Is that gonna be the the final thing that we are, uh, we are working towards? Or is it just more of from that point, you're then pushed into another world tier and you keep going and going and going. And that's one of the things I really love about mm. D4 is that more than any of the previous Diablo games, there's just so much more choice in how you lean into that power fantasy from what does your barbarian look like or what does your sorceress look like? You know, what are the skills that you're using and how you leverage them? The fact that you can pull legendary like affixes or abilities off of, you know. Did he just say pull? I guess pull out of the weapon? Is that what he's gonna say? equipment and weapons and place okay. them into other weapons and all okay the okay because for a second when he said pull you guys know that another association with the word pull is gotcha and i was like wait wait, wait, wait what, what what kind of pull are we talking about here my guy anyway let me see here pent up axe legendary axe slashing uh 7.5 percent critical strike damage 17 percent overpower damage it effect 5.5 percent stun chance 16 percent strength wow that's a man, that that looks big uh, Fury skills deal 4% more damage for every second. You haven't used the Fury skill up to 24%. Bent up glowing essence. Fury skills, oh, so you extract it from there. And then you can put this in one-handed weapon, two-handed weapons, gloves, amulets, or rings. Okay. You can only put this in legendary items, though. All right. Like affixes or abilities off of you know equipment and weapons and place them into other weapons and all the permutations you're not locked into i'm looking for bloody choker item before adding essence essence upgrades the item oh no you can actually you can actually put this in rare amulet of pulling whirlwind <laughs> you get all of the same things plus the barbarian thing okay so you basically upgrade items into legendary status a set of boots. okay you found that boots cool but I'm going to actually put that on my sword because there's something else I want on my boots that's going to make this amplified in a way that you've never seen before because you've never had that really that freedom before. This is actually one of my favorite aspects yeah, and this things is really that good. they're doing in Diablo 4. The fact that they're letting you basically take the reason you have a particular item because of the unique effect that it gives you and move that to another piece of 
gear to another gear slot. Ideally, that's going to make the possibility for different builds a lot more varied and a lot more interesting because I know, for example, in Diablo 3, if I'm going for this particular build, I know exactly what pair of boots I'm going to be wearing because I need that exact particular buff and that buff is only on the boots. And so that means those are the boots that I'm wearing, you know? But in Diablo 4, theoretically, I could have that buff. This is also going to make the game a balancing nightmare. Then again, it's not like Diablo is ever properly balanced to begin with, but this one's going to include PvP from the get-go. Can get messy. <clears throat> the boots and I can move it to something else, opening up the possibility for me to wear another pair of boots, right? So that is really exciting. This system of being able to transfer the powers on this high rarity gear to other slots, I think is really, it just, I feel like it's going to open up a lot more potential, which is great. All those choices that it's really going to feel like your power fantasy is your class, your character, your build. Even if we both play barbarians, they're both going to look very different. We're going to have very different builds uh, and they're going to play very differently because of the skill trees and the immense paragon boards that we can like you know choose our path through those which is going to be very different as well and that is a that is a great concept i just don't know i feel like i haven't really played a game where there still hasn't been some meta there hasn't yeah, been there's a always best a build for different types of content a best aoe clearing build a best single target build a best pve build the best pvp build the best support build every season when diablo a new season diablo 3 season comes out there are plenty of lists out there as a meta list of this is the exact best build that you can do and again they are doing some different things here and like i said it is exciting that you can transfer these uh, powers from this high rarity gear onto other slots but there will still probably be a configuration that ultimately when the numbers all crunch out that will be the ideal version of that particular play style of that particular class type yep. for each bits of content i don't know in any game like this in any game with like extensive skills and modifications to the skills and any rpg mmo like loot game arpg there does still always seem to be something that the community settles on as the ideal for that different those different aspects of the game and maybe d4 will be one to find the real the real challenge is always figuring out what is the like how much how much uh, how much variety can we have in any given build not in any given build but in any given class to allow for different play styles that that kind of becomes a thing so even though there's a meta let's say that there's like a meta where okay your your shit deals like five percent more damage than any other build but if you play this different build, you get to experience a different play style and your, your damage difference is only in the five percentile. So it's not really a big deal. Uh, <clears throat> and how different is that gameplay experience and how viable is that gameplay experience and all of these things. So say for instance, okay, Whirlwind Barbarian is the best. You have to play Whirlwind Barbarian if you give a shit about just like being the best. But what about if some kind of like Shockwave Barbarian is also extremely viable within like a 5% damage difference, but it provides you with a very different play style that you consider to be more fun. Then I kind of feel like that is okay. It's not the end of the world. It's all about like how viable are things going to be because it's going to be like, okay, so what about if uh, the whirlwind barbarian is simply the best and it deals 50% more damage than any of the other builds that you can do? Well, then at that point, if you're going to be playing any of the other builds, you're just dumb. See, that's, that's the thing. Like you can't, there is a way to have freedom in what types of builds that you do. And even though those builds may not be the most meta builds, they are still going to be like viable. You know, and, and a way that I looked at, at this, like, for instance, in Monster Hunter, right? Currently in Monster Hunter, the most powerful play style is fundamentally uh, full burst with, uh, what's what's it called? The, the Torsi Lavatur, which is like, the, for, for, for Gunlands, the, the, the most, the, the, the best Gunlands play style is definitely full burst Lavatur with uh, <clears throat> a bunch of damage stuff to increase the, the physical damage the gun lands whilst also dealing maximum shelling damage, all of this. This is like the most powerful playstyle, and it's clearly exemplified by when Ryu plays the gun lands. Playing uh, Bullet Barrage, I still think is somewhat viable. Uh, I still think it's fine. And even playing Poke Shell Poke is still fine. The damage differential is significant, but it's not like the end of the world. So... You know, you have all of these different play styles and you get to choose. I think that that is kind of okay. But if you get to a point where it's like, oh, but this one just deals so much more damage that the other ones are fucking useless, 
that's when you have a problem with the game. So I, I hope that they allow for different play styles uh, in Diablo 4 with all of these different builds that you can do and all of these different acts of affixes as opposed to just like, no, it's whirlwind barb or nothing. Finally break it. The Paragon tree system seems pretty cool that they're working on and all these adjustments and tunings that you can do and this variety of mixing and matching. But anytime I hear a developer tell me, oh yeah, in this game, we might be playing the same class and even going for the same type of build, but they'll still, each of ours will be very different. And when I hear that, it just makes me think, yeah, one of yours will be the bad version of the build. <laughs> yeah. One of yours will probably be the one that you copy pasted online from all the theory crafters crunching the numbers on their Excel sheets. I hope that's not the case, or maybe it maybe it doesn't even matter. Maybe I don't even care. I just want to know what the good build is for the thing I want to do. And rather than mess around with it too much, um, which we'll get to here in a second, might just cost you a lot of in-game currency or yeah, time. Yeah, there it is. And uh, yeah, in that case, I don't want to waste that. I don't want to waste the currency or their time. So just tell me what the good build is. Google, you got me? Yeah, you got me. <laughs> okay, so that is basically it for the like world tiers and difficulty discussion. The other video that came out a few days earlier really dove into the class identity, stuff like the skill system, and talked a bit about character progression as well. So we started with a couple of classes and we had some really cool ideas for, for class mechanics that would be specific to those. It proved to be very compelling, not just in terms of the gameplay of the class, but also if you're playing uh, a barbarian and then you, maybe you're, you're grouped up with a sorceress and the sorceress is using her class mechanic, it really, you look at that and you're like, oh, well that, there's lots of really interesting gameplay there that I could check out, you know, in the future, maybe on a future season or, or something like that. And so we really wanted the classes to shine in their own ways and differentiate from each other. This is actually something that I feel like WoW does immensely well. There is a quite a different feel to a lot of the classes in World of Warcraft. Yes. The perfect <laughs> example for me was the first time I played as a demon hunter. Felt like I was playing a different game from when I was playing on my warrior or from when I was playing on... Yeah, that's because demon hunter is a hero class. And Blizzard just loves to suck dick on all of their hero classes. Like, oh yes, the, the Death Knight has to be amazing because it's a hero class. The Demon Hunter has to be amazing because it's a hero class. Now it's the Drac Theory. The Drac Theory Voker has to be amazing because it's a hero class. And fuck everybody else, especially vanilla classes like Warrior. Fuck them, fuck them dead. We don't care. It's like, bro, no, I think Demon Hunter is not a good example. I mean, it's a good example of in terms of like feel, but I have a particular disdain towards demon hunters and death knights and probably the same will be for Drakthir evokers, but whatever. The monk. What's a hero class? It's a class that doesn't start at level one. They'll start like a higher level because they'll usually launch together with an expansion. And traditionally, even though Blizzard will say, no, 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 we balance every class accordingly. Everybody knows that hero classes get preferential treatment, period, period. Hero classes always get preferential treatment. I will challenge anyone who defies me on this 100%. Hero classes always, always, always get preferential treatment. As a matter of fact, Demon Hunters have been getting preferential treatment since they were launched in fucking Legion, while Warriors have been paying taxes since fucking Vanilla. And then, you know, it is what it is. Adding additional mechanics, and particularly in that case, Demon Hunter has a double jump and a glide, and even just that difference in movement capabilities felt drastically different from playing any of the other classes in the game. It's more so than just, oh, I'm a warrior and I can cleave and whirlwind, and oh, I'm a wizard and I can cast fireball and ice bolt or something. Having mechanics that make these feel different beyond what is sort of like a superficial level, a great thing for any RPG to have have and i'm really hopeful that the various class mechanics that there are implementing in d4 manage to kind of reproduce that as well the skill trees have evolved dramatically over the course of development i would say we're on number four M many oh. iterations <laughs> and a lot of it has come it is actually crazy just how many variations of a skill tree they've gone through not even just cosmetically which there have been some drastic changes the the most ridiculous of one was the actual like massive literal tree with all the little branches coming off of your different skills 
Wales. It's kind of cool, but I just feel like like visually it was too much and it, it didn't feel very clean. But they've had a few different variations, not only just visually, but like literally functionally and concerning the depth. Like there were some early variations of the skill tree that just very, very simple, very, very streamlined. And it seems like the one that they've settled on is looking pretty deep and, and ha very interesting and a, a lot more uh, potentially a variation in the types of builds and things that you can do, even if it's not the ideal builds, right? Even if it's not the min-max builds. I love theory crafting. Like I, that's one of the things that draws me these types of games is how do I make a build? How do I set up skills? How do I make things work together? And you want a lot of depth there so that you have a lot of choice. So we're not just making the same build all the time. Like we're both fire sorceresses and we know exactly what skills we're using. And, and so you want enough choice there that you can kind of customize it, make it feel unique to yourself, but not there's games where you would go into it and you go like, oh, that's way too complicated just go look up a website tell me what i have to put in oh and something else about this i know that i mentioned you know there is going to be this ideal like meta i guess it's also important to consider that that only really matters for like the most hardcore players the people who are going to yeah. be continuously <laughs> playing this game six months after release there is that different layer of people who will get exposed to these systems and will interact with these systems and they will have the variety where our two whirlwind barbarians can play drastically differently because it doesn't matter because they're not pushing the higher world tiers they're not fighting that level 100 boss they don't need to min max and they're not really all that concerned and there is value in that even if the people who stick around longer is a smaller percentage of the total number of people who are going to end up playing and buying diablo 4 um, and those are the ones that you do want to cater to the long term because they're the ones playing and that's also why as a live service game they can make those adjustments so they can launch this game and have all these really cool pitches and these really cool ideas for that broad audience that are going to be like oh yeah jump in and check out my world one barbarian he sucks but he I like them. And then as the game progresses and it, the player base whittles down smaller and smaller to the, just the most dedicated, then in season two, three, and four, they can make the updates and make the changes that that base is demanding. And that they are serving two different audiences in that sense. I was just making somebody else's build because the, the way you made a build was so complicated. I couldn't feel like I could own the theory crafting. And, and that's, I think, a line that we've been walking is trying to make sure that you have lots of choices, both active and passive skills, is still sort of grokkable that you can go and theory craft yourself and you can still create your own build and i actually do like theory crafting myself as long as it doesn't feel like a detriment and i think that's another thing to consider now in the dragonflight pre-patch and wow i've been playing a monk and i've been playing around with the talent tree and i've been trying different talents picking up here and there and it's been fun while i'm just screwing around but i know when dragonfly comes out and i'm going to be pushing doing group dungeons or going into that first raid the time to fool around uh, has passed right and now it's time to be serious and now it's time to find those good builds and so there there is another side to that where it's cool to mess around and theory craft on my own up until it matters really <laughs> that's how i it is like <clears throat> i feel like in a way if it gets to a point where you need to check out which ones are the most mathematically important builds. I feel like that is when a lot of times you've gone too far on the complexity of the game. I kind of feel like builds should provide enough of a variety where the players themselves can kind of like define their own play style and use that to min-max and do all of that stuff. The problem ends up being that a lot of the times... When you mess around with trees, um, depending on your understanding of each of the stats and depending on your understanding of each of the class mechanics and how it works in tandem with whatever dungeon you're running and all of these things, uh, you can have tremendously different output um, versus you trying to make your own tree. And I do feel like that is a problem because I feel like <clears throat> it should be instinct instinct not instinctual but intuitive enough where most people should be able to figure out work what what works best for them uh for any given situation unfortunately that is not the case even with the current trees like i've filled around with the trees and i've made my own builds that i compare them to the performance that you can get out of like a a meta build and i was very surprised because like i thought my build was pretty good it wasn't <laughs> That's how I approach it, at least. Because you don't have this, the connection where, you know, a skill is literally below this other skill and you must take right. one point in this and then you, that you saw in D2, but you have all of these sort of 
uh, natural connections between things like the skill causes bleeding and the skill benefits from bleeding. And right. so we've built this uh, skill tag system. We've authored this ability to search the skill tags. So you can highlight nodes that are related to that. And so you can sort of see how these things are interconnected. And I cannot tell you how amazing of a feature that is as simple yeah. as it is as like attaching keywords to different skills as, as a matter of fact i wish that there this feature was already implemented in the current talent tree of world of warcraft because a lot of times it may i have trouble like finding certain talents and i'm like i know i've seen this talent somewhere and i'm just like going around looking through all the different nodes and shit to try to find a specific talent that i want It'd be so useful just to be able to go in there and type thunderclap and it just lists all the nodes that are related to Thunderclap or Rend, and it would list all the nodes associated with Rend or any other ability, uh, and the thing would be really, really good. Based on different effects, the uh, bleed as the example, especially with a skill tree like this, a skill tree so massive, any other game that I've played yeah, with, with really, really expansive skill trees with like tens to hundreds of different potential nodes to invest points into spending the time mousing over each and every single one of them to read what they do and try to figure out if they're connected to the thing that you're trying to do having the keywords to be like uh bleed a uh, whirlwind and then see Fire, every single node that ice, is related to that and decide lightning. oh do i want that reduced cost do i want this increased damage all of these relate to no whirlwind even though they're all over the place i'll be able to quickly find them and make adjustments based off of that that is like it's so simple it's a keyword search but it's amazing. It's amazing. So this next section that touches on respects has actually been like highly debated in the community I've, over the past. This is the one, here. boys. So you here can it goes. respec point by point. You can directly in the skill tree for gold, and that gold uh, cost ramps up uh, at some rate as you level up. So as you clearly define your build and like get more things that are that are associated with it and supporting it, it becomes a little bit more expensive to respec, but still doable. Okay, so skill respecing is a gold sink. Gold sinks are important in the these games so that they, it, they just doesn't inflate out of control and then gold becomes basically pointless because you have so much of it. Great. That's one of the things that's really different between D3 and D4 is like D3, once you get to a certain place, you the difference between one build to another is like, I gotta go change my clothes. You know, because you're really focused on being set based or very equipment based so that it, your build is kind of defined by your equipment more than anything else. So you're like, oh, I wanna change from fire to ice. Let me go change my clothes real quick. Yeah, and that is absolutely the case. I. I, I find it interesting the way that he is saying this is almost as if it's a negative and I'm like, this is, this is a good thing. You can just like change your set, change a couple of runes, good to go. I see this as a good thing, right? Am, am I wrong here? Like, I think this is fine. You just like change your stuff whenever you want. Like, listen, one of the cool things about the new World of Warcraft talent trees is guess what? At any point, any time, so long as I'm not in combat, I can just go be like, boop. I want to swap this talent over here. Good. Going for gear sets or going for different special effects on the different pieces of gear to determine the strength of your build because once your character is max level, you have all of your potential skills and all of the variations of that skill with those additional modifiers. You strengthen them and you alter them further entirely based on the gear, the different things that you have on your weapons, the gear set bonuses, all of that, right? That is what plays into like this, the specialization, the customization and where, where you really find tune and hone your build and build upon it and that's one of the things about the uh, the gold cost going up over time is that basically get you get there's going to be a point in time where i'll make up a number but like say at level 50 there's gonna be a point in time where you go like oh i'd like to be a different barbarian but it's too expensive to undo everything I've done, it's actually better for me to roll another Barbarian and start a new one and go fresh. Um, and we wanted that that notion that with each level you progress down a character, you're kind of becoming more and more attached to it and, and getting more and more sort of settled with it so that you're not just going. See, this is something that I don't, I don't agree with that particular design philosophy of it's like, oh, the more you invest points into a character, the more attached you become to it and all of these things. I find that fundamentally nowadays, I love respecking. I love fucking around with things. Now, back in the day in Diablo 2, this is the way that it used to work. You would have stats that you would invest into your character. And therefore, you know, once you build a character, that character is kind of like set in stone like that. That, that, that was pretty much the case back in Diablo 2, for those of you not aware. Like, I'll, like I'll, give you a, I'll give you an example of like some really unorthodox characters that people would make and that I've if made, for instance, could be so in the form incandescent. of like a dexterity sorceress. You guys are going to be like, what the fuck? A dex why? 
Why would you have a dexterity sorceress? Because then you could put on a shield and dexterity affected, affected how good you were at blocking. And so you'd be running around with a fucking tanky sorceress that would be damn near unkillable in PvP. You'd, you'd just be like walking around, you'd have Barbarian come through, Whirlwind right through you, and you'd be going, ding, da, ding, 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 ding. You'd block every hit. It was disgusting. But yeah, you'd, you'd do some really nasty shit with uh, with those builds. Ashka Grimrose, thank you very much for being Grosky Nesson for a full year. Tip of the hat. Appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm level 65, and now I'm just going to change my clothes and become a completely different barbarian, you know? So This is what I'm seeing a lot of arguments around, and I understand because there's two ways to look at this. Their idea with this and what they've said about this is that they want it to feel like your choice matters, right? Your, your The choices, the skills that you select matter, and if you invest in your ice sorceress or your lightning sorceress, once you get to a certain point, a certain level, a certain world tier, whatever, it becomes so expensive that if you want to make a different type of sorceress, you would just re-roll it, right? Instead of... Another big problem with this, by the way, is the fact that Blizzard is historically atrocious at balancing their games. Like, I mean, they are fucking terrible. It is potentially one of the worst things that they know how, that they have in their skill set is how to actually balance their goddamn games. So imagine if you're like, oh, I want to be a lightning sorceress. And you put all of your points into lightning. And then a certain patch, Blizzard's like, you know what? Lightning feels a little bit too overpowered. And then they nerf it into the fucking ground. And your sorceress is now useless and you can't deal any damage. And you're like, well, I guess I'll respec into fire sorceress. And it's like, oh, shit. Look at the amount of gold this is going to cost me. That is wild. I'm not going to be able to do that. Guess I have to start a new sorceress. You're going to be starting a new sorceress out of fucking spite. At which point, instead of you maybe considering, okay, should I start? You're probably going to start considering, should I play this character that I want to play? Because you're like, I want to play a sorceress. Or should I just look at what the current flavor of the month class is and just play that instead? And I argue that a large majority of players are just going to like pick whatever happens to be the flavor of the month when they, have, when they can't respec their current character. Honestly, that just make a new character comment is putting me off the game already. That's how you get less attached to a character. Exactly! Like, th this is one of the reasons why I don't play alts in World of Warcraft, because, like, there's all of this progress that I've already done in my main character, and Blizzard makes it, like, that progress doesn't carry over almost at all to your alt characters, like your reputations, the quests that you've done, all these things. There's no way to just, like, carry that out to an alt and, and that makes me like, whenever I play an alt, I already know it's never going to be like a long-term investment because like, no, I already have all the things that I want. My main character, I just want to play my main character. And then you have also the problem of balance, which like I said, they balance like shit. So, you know, therein lies the problem. But on top of it, um, like if you think, for instance, of something like Final Fantasy XIV, I can do everything on the same character and I'm definitely super attached to my character, despite the fact that it is very much like he just said, it's a change of fucking clothes. Yes, this is why I'm super attached to my Final Fantasy XIV character, because he can be a fucking paladin, a warrior, a fucking dragoon. He can be whatever the fuck I want, and he carries over every single bit of progress that I've ever had on that character. This is very much a good thing. But, you know, at least that's my, that's my opinion on that particular bit of uh, respecking because respecking is too expensive obviously the hang-ups on this are what if you make a bad build it, it becomes too expensive it's gonna if you make a bad build it's gonna be harder to grind the gold to respec it so yep. then you're just gonna go through that whole process and re-level and does that mean and this and this is going to be another thing the fact that it there's a prohibitive cost to respecking basically means that there's going to be less people actually experimenting with different builds because like the fuck do you mean experiment with a different build? The, if I if I put one wrong point into this character, that's 50 hours gone. Well, maybe not one point because you would still be able to refund the one point. But like you guys get the point. It's like you, you, you put enough you put enough wrong points to get to a certain node that you think is going to be good. And then you get there and the node is shit. And the respec, point, uh, the respec cost of, res of changing all of those things back into a workable build is going to be incredibly prohibitive. It is going to limit experimentation, grossly limit experimentation.
you've lost all of the gear, are you going to be able to transfer that gear between your characters? If not, you got to regrind and also hope for the drops and hope for these different rolls to get that really good item that you want. Or on the flip side, no, I don't want to reroll, but my build is terrible. So it takes me forever to clear content. So it takes me even longer there. I definitely understand the idea of wanting to have an investment and having like, this is my, this is my whirlwind barb. And if I want a different, if I want a seismic slam barb, I got to make a new barb. And I guess to a degree, that's kind of what seasons are in a way. You're always starting over on seasons. You're making a new character, but there's just so many questions that we don't quite know. Like they're saying it might be too expensive to respec and you might want to make a new one, but is it really? Is gold like, like it is in Diablo three where it doesn't matter. Like I'll have enough gold that I can respec if I want. Sure. Maybe I can't respec 10 times a day. Maybe that's too expensive, but can I respec and go finally look up and make that meta build that I find online after a couple of days of grinding? If that's possible, then maybe we won't need to reroll. The other thing we don't know is how difficult is it to level up a new character? How long is it going to take in D3 for a season? You hit max level and like, you just got to get those boosts from the premium battle pass, baby. Well, although the boosts also come on the free, uh, por at least according to what they've said so far, the boosts also come on the free portion of the battle pass. But like, listen, man, you just get that premium battle pass tier and you'll be able to boost them characters like nobody's business. A couple hours. I think you can hit max level in like under two hours if you do proper speed running, like chest farming or, or kill streak farming or something. Like it's not very difficult to hit max level in D3. Now it does seem like that's not going to be quite the case in D4, but we don't know. And we also don't know how seasons affect that. We know that there's going to be like leveling boost in seasons. They're going to be part of the battle pass. So there's still a lot of questions. I understand the idea of wanting to be invested in a character, but I do think like a lot of the drawbacks might just be too much. But again, maybe not depending on the rate of gold acquisition depending on the time to take to max level. If it's not very difficult to just make a second barb so I can have my whirlwind and my seismic slam barb, sure, I guess, whatever. And if it's not too difficult to grind gold, then maybe I can just respec. It's just, there's too many questions. I feel like though, honestly, I would prefer, it doesn't need to be like D3 where I can just constantly, completely swap my build as much times as I want without any restrictions. But I also think maybe it shouldn't be so restrictive that I feel like I'm forced to make a new character. Right. I feel yep. like for personally, that would be the ideal balance between those two. So those were the two videos. Those were the two videos from IGN. And these were actually, I feel like a lot more substantial than some of the earlier ones. There's a lot more details, information, and actually interesting points of discussion and stuff brought up. There have actually been quite a few beta leaks that have been coming out as well over the course of like this past week. This video is already going to be pretty long though. So I'm probably going to save that for another video, but just some interesting stuff and insight from people playing the game right now who don't care to break the NDA. So there you go. And yeah, also dude, the frequency of these. This, this is actually interesting how people just give no shits about Diablo 4's NDA. It, it's almost like Blizzard's like, hey, sign this NDA agreement. All right. And then people just turn around, wipe their ass with it. Like that, that kind of feels like what people are doing. They're just like, ah, fuck your NDAs, man. I don't give a fuck. It's so weird. <laughs> updates has just been at such a pace right now that it seems pretty clear they are ramping up for some big marketing push and this also lends us to believe that the leaks that we've been seeing recently are probably true and those are that we're going to be getting a, a announcement soon the current timeline suggests there will be an official announcement during this year's game awards that takes place on december 8th and at this point blizzard is planning to reveal the official release date of diablo 4 and also opening up pre-order sales for the game now when when will that release be? Well, those same leaks say that they are aiming for sometime in April. So no, it would actually be an in-season April Fool's joke. Uh, it's cool. There's lots of stuff going oh, on with this no. game and I am genuinely still very excited. Lots of questions still, of course, about like the monetization model. We just bring it up every time there's a D4 video because yeah, I think it's it's going to be important long term. But monetization aside, if we forget that that's an aspect, aspect of the game, in terms of the gameplay and systems and all this stuff, like it looks like it, this game is going to be pretty cool and it looks like it's going to be fun to play. I'm looking forward to diving in and we can criticize and, and complain about different areas of the game, the gameplay and the monetization model once it's finally out. Or if I get access to the beta at some point and there isn't an NDA and we can talk about it. But as of now, neither of those things are happening. I'm not in. And if I was, I couldn't tell you, but I will tell you because I'm not in. So, so yeah, uh, that's it for today, guys. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this update on Diablo 4. I will continue to keep an eye on the latest news as it pops up and make videos but that's it for today thank you for watching i'll see you next time
Well, yeah. it looks like it's like there's st- there's so many red flags. I feel like around this game, they keep messing it up once again. I said at the start, I'll say it again. Get in there, hit that like button, um, and give it some watch time. <clears throat> All of the usual jazz. But yeah, there's a lot of. I feel like there's more and more red flags every time that we look into Diablo Four. We the game just can't catch a break. It's uh, it's weird. Weird, my dudes. Very very weird.